to go on the discuss go on the discussion. That's fine. I, I got it. You got him. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, we're live now. It looks like. Yay! Oh, yay! yay. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> there we go. At long last, we are I'm here. So sorry for the delay. Oh my gosh, that was. <laughs> Lots of problems. We had to shut it off and come back. Well, hello. And now finally we have Writers of Wine going. Um, so you can watch us live on the discussion tab um, in our event. Um, I will go ahead and just um, kind of get us started. I know we're starting a little bit late. I'm Tara Gilboy. Um, I'm the author of Unwritten and then the sequel Rewritten, which just came out in April, which are middle grade fantasy. Um, so I will go ahead and, and let you guys introduce yourself. Um, Whoever I guess wants to jump in next. Um, well, I will. I am Michelle Barker, and I am the author of my long list of impossible things, which just came out in March. Um, it is not fantasy, but I have written fantasy before, and I guess I should have brought my fantasy novel to show up, but I didn't. It was called The Beggar King. It was published about seven years ago. So, uh, I think it's on the shelf behind me somewhere. It might be there. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's there. Erin. Uh, I'm Erin Bow, and I'm most recently the author of Stand on the Sky, uh, which is middle grade real, but I have written fantasy and I brought mine just to nah, show you You're up. prepared. Yeah. <laughs> um, playing Kate, awesome. which is a Russian flavored high fantasy with a talking cat in it, and uh, Sorrow's Not, which no one read, but it's still <laughs> my baby. <laughs> All right, hi, I'm. Henry Hertz, and uh, to date I've written 10 picture books and one chapter book, and I've got a middle grade um, out on Query. Uh, I love fantasy. I've got, uh, this was my first one, Monster Goose Nursery Rhymes, Aww. and some other ones, a little um, sort of prequel to Alice in Wonderland, and, and then this is sci-fi. Technically it's not, uh, oops. Uh, two pirates and one robot. <laughs> space pirates. So uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. I'm so glad we have like um, every kind of age category of children's books covered here. We've got picture books all the way up through YA. So I think this will be a really, uh, really interesting discussion. Um, I'm curious because we've all written fantasy, um, quite a wide variety of fantasy. And I think, you know, as we were kind of talking um, before, Erin, um, you had kind of mentioned and, and talked about, um, you know, where we got our love for fantasy. And I think you phrased it better than I can. I think you said, what fantasy writer did you imprint on like a duckling? Um, and I thought <laughs> that, was way, that was way more interesting than, uh, than I could have phrased it. So mm -hmm. um, what about what about you guys? Uh, did you grow up writing fantasy? Who was your favorite? Who was your favorite fantasy writer? I can start. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I remember distinctly uh, getting thrilled with discovering uh, where the wild things are in elementary school and borrowing the book over and over again from the school library. And uh, I think that got me hooked. And then I think fifth grade, I discovered Lord of the Rings and that's all she wrote. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was a fantasy fan at that point. I read Lord of the Rings in sixth grade. I remember it quite clearly. I remember where I was when I read that book for the first time. Um, that's, yeah, I think we might have all imprinted on Lord of the Rings <laughs> or the entire genre imprinted on Lord of the Rings, sometimes in a little bit of a problematic way. I also imprinted on The, the Last Unicorn at a really vulnerable age and um, The Wizard of Earthsea. Oh, oh yeah, that's yeah. the one that's mine that's, that's mine yours. oh my goodness yeah yeah I never thought I was going to write fantasy it never occurred to me I didn't read it growing up at all um and actually I I sort of stumbled into C.S. Lewis and Narnia but sure. but the one that really got me was A Wizard of Earthsea that was just I talk about being imprinted like a duckling that's exactly I would have followed her to the end of the earth <laughs> so she's I love amazing that she yeah she amazing really writer. really is yeah yeah. Peter, I had the pleasure of meeting Peter Beagle a few times. He's really just a gentleman. Oh, um, I want to reach through the screen and touch the hand that touched the hand. <laughs> of Peter Beagle. Only we can do these in person. Mm -hmm. 
No, I have, you know, I, I, um, I've never read that. Now I need to, um, I, I was like you, Michelle, I actually didn't read a lot of fantasy as a kid, which is surprising because it's like all I write now pretty much is fantasy. Mm, that's true. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I read a lot of, um, more historical fiction. Um, but I, I mean, I did read some fantasy, but I think the fantasy that like really got me was the Harry Potter series. And it's funny because like everybody else was reading it and I put it off and I was like, it was like one of those books, you know, that so many people were into that I was like, I'm not going to read that. It was probably not any good. And I put it off. Mm. And then I remember the, it was like the week that the last book came out, the Deathly Hallows book. And I was like, that's oh, how long you waited. Uh-huh. Wow. Oh my goodness. I mean, I'll read it. So I was like, <laughs> series. and like, that's all I did for like two weeks straight in the summer was I sat outside. My daughter was young and I remember she was in her kiddie pool and I'm like, just sitting outside by her, like reading these books. And she'd be like, I need something. And I'd be like, shut get it in a second. You know, <laughs> and I kept making more and more trips to go to the store. Um, and I finally I read like the whole series and like, oh, hey, yeah. mommy, mommy, shh, you ate yesterday. I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Wait till your dad gets home. From <laughs> I don't even know you. <laughs> That's great. But did you? So if you, if the people who grew up reading fantasy, did you think that you were going to write fantasy? Was that sort of your like? your dream when you when you read it that oh, I, I read Lord of the Rings I want to write something like that or or not didn't quite happen like that it never even occurred to me that writing was a thing that actual human beings did mm. um I know I'm I go to a lot of schools now and all these all the schools unless I'm really out in the wild someplace with a grant have <laughs> had writer visits and the students seem to be aware that writers are human beings who produce books and I just never had that sense I didn't know any writers uh, it didn't occur to me until well into my 20s that writing was a thing you could do for a living yes. um, which is probably fortunate because it turns out you know eh, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ish, a living is it? a living yeah. a living yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, but once I fell into writing, it just kind of tumbled out as fantasy. I didn't give it any thought. I just started writing a fantasy. Huh. Mm -hmm. That's okay. How about you, Henry? I had never written fiction until maybe I was late 40s and uh, early 50s and late 40s and then I, I had two sons and I wanted to get them interested in reading fantasy because I like fantasy so I I drafted a story for them that was purely intended just for them mm -hmm. and one thing led to another and we ended up self-publishing it and um, but we what I discovered was that I really I love to write fiction so um, it was a middle-aged discovery for me and it's I'm really glad that I've oh, got it because now you know, when I retire, I can keep doing it. And it's, you know, there's no reason to not write. As long as you don't re re rely on it for a living. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And like, Tara, you've written a lot of fantasy. Did you, you always knew that that was what you were going to be writing? No, um, I thought I would, well, I started, but I started, I, I, first I kind of intended, I thought I would be an adult novel writer um and I started writing out writing just like you know real kind of literary realistic contemporary short stories um then I thought I'd write when I first started writing for children I thought I'd write historical um because like I'd grown up reading all that and when I was little I only wrote stories about like pioneers basically um, <laughs> and it like it. um but then so but uh, as I was in grad school I was writing a lot of historical and and I was realizing I was really getting caught up in a lot of the research and a lot of what I was writing was just like really boring because like how many descriptions do you need of like a log cabin or like Dorian <laughs> Garrett like you know what I mean like this mm -hmm. is these are just the kind of things I was writing um and I can never think of like exciting things to happen and so for me it was just easier to think of journeys and exciting things to happen when those took place in a fantasy, mm -hmm. um, fantasy. so um what about you, Michelle? Because you started writing fantasy and then moved into historical. And then I moved into historical. Which, but they're not as different from each other as you would think, actually, because there's world building, I find, involved in both. But yeah, I, I mean, I fell into fantasy in a weird way because I'd been doing a lot of, again, I'd been doing like adult things like you, like short stories and, and nonfiction and poetry and whatever. And I remember I was reading C.S. Lewis and I thought I was, I was going to write a novel for kids, but I didn't really know what it was going to be. And I thought it was going to be realistic and contemporary. And I started reading C.S. Lewis and I thought, oh, wait a minute. Like I could, 
I could make this up. Like, you know, I, I could make up my own world. And it was like, it's, it was this sort of earth shattering realization, which seems so obvious when I think about it now, but I, <laughs> like, yeah, that is what writers do. They make things up. But I, for some reason, I, it had never occurred to me that I could just like make up my own world and, and do whatever I wanted essentially, which seemed really easy at the time. Um, <laughs> little did I know that it actually wasn't easy at all. I sort of thought, oh yeah, this will be easier than writing historical fiction because like I won't have to do any research. So sure, like just, you know, throw it together. Yeah. Um, and then I remember <laughs> I, I, I wrote my first draft of this book quite quickly and I sent it to this wonderful man um, who was my mentor for, I don't know, probably the first 15 years or so of my writing life. And he sent me back 10 pages of questions um, essentially like my first real lesson in world building because I did I had no idea what I was doing absolutely not so um, yeah so that so I got this 10 pages of questions and I thought oh yeah got a little work to do <laughs> yeah what do they say uh, uh, with great power comes great responsibility if, if yeah. you if you own the world you get to do whatever you want but you better yes. make sure your world is defined and self-consistent Oh my God. And I mean, that's like, you know, when you talk about the challenges of writing fantasy, like that might be the number one is like, great, you get to make the rules, but you better be playing by them because uh, otherwise it's not going to work. I don't know if we want to talk about, you know, there's a whole spectrum, right? From a completely foreign world to mm -hmm. fantasy, light fantasy, you know, urban fantasy, where it's pretty familiar with just maybe some creatures or a little bit of magic, like, uh, I mean, Patrick Rothfuss, The uh, Name of the Wind is right. not very fantasy-ish. It's got magic, but it's light fantasy, I would say, compared to epic fantasy. Mm -hmm. so, I, never, I never know where to draw the boundaries. I always feel I mean, like someone can. wants to draw a boundary and then wants to fight about it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it is, I think of them as like toolkits I can steal from, um, as opposed to boundaries across which thou shalt not pass. Um, but yeah, there are all kinds of fantasy and what well, the one that always gets me is I've written fantasy and then I writ, wrote two books of science fiction and people are always amazed that you do both. And I don't know where to put the line. That's a really tricky line, that one. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I've tried to define the two of them. And the only thing that I've been able to come up with is that science fiction is something that at a certain point in time maybe could actually happen, whereas fantasy is something that no, it, it actually couldn't. But I don't even know if that's a- I don't even know a, that that's true. No. I mean, the line doesn't really matter, does it? But I mean, the only people it's gonna to matter to are librarians and bookstore employees, yes. right? Yeah. But, yeah, but those I mean, are I would argue get it's, the if it's technology the based, it's sci-fi. And if it's based on some other system, then it's fantasy. Because hmm. they're both not real. And mm -hmm. so there's some sci-fi that could never be true if, you know, based on our understanding today, like time travel. Right. So, mm -hmm. so what is fine, right? But the difference is it's a techno, it's a implied technological solution as opposed to something else and something magical. Mm -hmm. That's like a distinction. I like that one. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. I have a book about um, transhuman consciousnesses and basically it's demonic possession, except it works with magnets. Hmm. <laughs> there is not well no there is not sadly okay there is not that's a topic i i know it's trending on twitter and i'm afraid to find out why oh you don't know why i don't know why oh well a, a doctor who's a big trump supporter is saying that dreaming about sex with demons can cause medical problems it's oh, this is the funny. one who was going to offer a vaccine for, yes, for that sort of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, much. right. It's, oh, dear. We, we'll okay. stay away from the politics. All right. All right. I think we okay. should. Stay out of politics, although something to ponder is, you know, as our world becomes more and more dystopian and fantastical, will that hurt our book sales? Are people still going to want to read fantasy? I don't oh, know. Yeah, yeah. Like, Tara, your fantasy, it's like, it's just like contemporary realism. I don't know. <laughs> right? What happened, guys? Actually, Michelle, the one that you're working on, probably. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I seriously like when we start drawing like those lines between like different kinds of fantasy and sci-fi and stuff. Like, I know for me, I feel like the big reason why I kind of choose that more realistic fantasy is just because I don't feel like my brain kind of works in that way where I want to come up with you know these kind of whole world and and I always feel like there's so much you know with like Lord of the Rings where you're there's so much work to do. Um, you know where some authors will create whole languages and the. Mm do all these things um where for me it's just easier to 
set it in the real world and then choose like one or two magical elements and then that's all I have to deal with you know what I mean the whole time um yeah so I don't know do you guys have like a reason why you choose the type of fantasy that you do or well that's actually such an interesting question because that's the reason why I stopped writing it is because I realized I didn't have a good answer to that question I had um written that one book, which took me, by the way, 10 years <laughs> after that very first quick first draft. And then I had to sort of learn how to learn how to write fantasy and then, and I guess, understand the world that I had created and, and develop it. But then I started asking myself, okay, why? Why, why have I created this world? And I, I do think that there are good reasons to create a fantasy world, especially because I think fantasy will often hold up a circus mirror to our world and uh, you know, show it in certain ways that if you were to, to deal with it head on, you wouldn't be able to do it as effectively. But I just, I felt for myself that unless I had a reason um, for why to do it that way, I, I, I couldn't, it somehow, I don't know, I came to a dead end there. And then, I mean, now with the, the book I'm working on now, I feel like I do have a reason because I'm looking forward into the future and, you know, dealing with, with futuristic topics that are, you know, like going to be on our horizon shortly, environmental and all of that. Um, but yeah, I, it's, I, I'd love to hear what other, other people think about that because I, had, I struggled with that. So for me, it depends on the idea for the story itself. Sometimes I know from the get-go, I'm going to do something specific. Like there was a, this was an adult short story that I wrote where the, the, it was for an anthology and the prompt was take a fairy tale and make the traditional villain the good guy. So right away, I've got, um, you know, in this case, it was Little Red Riding Hood. So I made the wolf... I decided, okay, well, the wolf is going to be a, a werewolf and he's going to be the good guy in Little Red Riding Hood. They don't want to make the a little girl the bad guy, so her, her grandparents are the bad guy. And so, ah! you know, mm -hmm. I didn't have to change much. I just had to uh, allow for the presence of werewolves and everything else that happens in there is straight up, it could happen in the real world. Other, other than werewolf, everything else is werewolves. fine. So mm -hmm. it, it really depends. Whereas, um, yeah, I mean, I guess the short answer is, it, it, if you're starting from a story concept, that will inform your choice of how much fantasy, how much world building you need to involve. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I think the right answer is just enough to effectively convey your story. And any more than that, you are investing a huge amount of time that you can't know, you know, like Tolkien, right? The millennia of history and multiple Nobody does it like Tolkien. No one right. starts I mean, by inventing an Elvish language. Right? <laughs> writes themselves some fan fiction so that they can use their Elvish language. Nobody yeah. does that. Man was crazy. <clears throat> That's the extreme. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a gift uh, to us all, but nevertheless. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about you, Erin? Um, I don't know that I have to have a reason. I think the stories are their own reason. I, um, when I, people ask you where you get your ideas, which is just, it's this crazy question. You know, it's like, I get my ideas. I'm trained as a particle physicist. Uh, I get my ideas by hitting other ideas against them at high speeds and seeing what happens. Mm. So I think I have an idea and I try to work with it and it doesn't work until I like hit it with another idea. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Several years down yeah. the road. Sometimes. Yes, sometimes, that's right. So right now I'm just, I'm drafting something and I'm noodling on something else. And the something else is the Merlin and love story that I have always said I'm gonna write. It's the, it's the, it's a love story um, that ends in a betrayal, but you tell it backwards because Merlin lives it out of order. And I've always wanted yeah. to do that. And I am looking for the setting. You know, I kind of have a, a sense of like the theme and the feel of it, but it, it won't get started until I have a good sense of the character's voice and the setting. Mm. And I probably will find that accidentally someday while reading National Geographic. Right? Right. I mean, that's exactly. And But I completely agree with you. I, it's funny because you think of these terms uh, in terms of particle particle physics, which I can't even say. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I spent some time sailing. And so I always used to think of it in terms of navigation. And so I would think mm -hmm. like in order to know where you are, you need to have at least two landmarks. Right. So mm -hmm. one is not enough. Right. You need to have that second one. They need to cross. 
and mm-hmm. there, it, it, for me anyways, that's where I find my story. If I like, I'll have one idea that, that, with what I'm working on right now, the ministry of sleep, I, I had the idea for the world, but I, it wasn't enough. And so I, it sat basically on my computer for, I don't know, two or three years mm-hmm. and, and, while I was doing other things. And I just figured, you know, at a certain point, something's going to come to me and I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do with this. But it's it just like you, right? It's like, you know, I'll be reading a magazine or walking down the street or, or somebody says something to me and it's like all the lights go on and then, oh, now I know what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it won't, it won't start till you get, I love that metaphor yeah. about the second point. I might steal that and use that in classroom. <laughs> Try ahead. to remember to credit you. <laughs> I would add that there is some... Uh, I've enjoyed doing this and it's probably just evidence that I'm a nerd, but um, if you can anchor your story in the real world, you get sort of bonus, the history is your world building. So mm-hmm. I did a steampunk story. It was a fractured version of Aladdin and, the, and the, uh, the magic lamp. And I set it in Turkey. And so the food and the locations and the who was the, the Sultan at the time was all, I looked it up. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I made it as historical as possible, knowing of course that I didn't have to because you know it's steampunk and there was there was a magic item and there was a sorcerer but Mm -hmm. but it was um i think it lends texture to the story and in in that case i didn't have to invent it i was borrowing it from from history so Mm -hmm. whatever works i like that i like that mix too the mix of fantasy and history i've always been interested in that i think that works very well I do too. And I love horror and history too. I don't know. I love anything matched up with history, but, um, you know, just kind of building on what you were saying too, Henry, I think like one of the things when you root things in the real world like that, um, sometimes you kind of, too, can avoid painting yourself into a corner with the magic. Cause I know like a lot of times there are certain things that I don't always notice, but you can end up with like plot flaws, like in um, like the Harry Potter series, for example, where it's like, you've created some form of magic and now it's like, you know, the characters have gotten themselves into a predicament later in the book. And, you know, so you have your readers wondering like, well, why couldn't they just use magic to get, you know what I mean? That kind of magic to get themselves out of it. Um, so it can kind of create, you know, those kinds of problems, I think too. Or you invent more magic to get characters out of a tricky mm. situation. I don't think yeah. that's yes, which is the that's cheap way cheap. out. But that's the cheap way out. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. I don't think that's a fantasy problem. I think that's just a writing problem. I mean, that's true. Yeah. Y- sure. you, you. So I'm an engineer, and uh, I'm logical, and I I try really hard to scour my plot lines to make sure that I don't leave gaping holes. You know, logic bombs like that. Mm. So. Um, it's oh, I just trip over me. the logic bombs. You just trip over them, they explode. <laughs> and then, but then in revision, you get a chance to make it look like you did that on purpose. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's fine. I Let's knew see. what I was doing the whole time. The whole time. <laughs> so <laughs> intricately plotted. As long as you don't crater the entire story because you Oh my God. Yeah, that, that happens, happens too. That happens too. But I, mean, I think it's a go ahead. like um what was that new Netflix show? Um the old guard, really cool, slick. Charlize Theron is the star, but I'm watching it. I'm like, oh, they they're just leaving these characters that are behaving in a way that is inconsistent with mm. their own setup, or that just drives me nuts. And it's like, just maybe it's different for visual arts, but for writing, I just feel like a good a good author, you should be making sure there aren't those obvious. Yes inconsistencies in your magic system in your Mm -hmm. character motivations you know so don't do that (laughs) i know but it it is a curse in the sense that uh, people who don't write can pick up a book or or watch netflix or whatever with some of those things and not it's like it's fine it works whatever but i i mean not maybe not for everybody but i find that for myself as well like if i'm if i'm watching something that doesn't hang together or if a character is behaving in a way that's that that doesn't fit it's like i get frustrated and I do too. There are some people though who don't have a lot of writing experience and then they're like so perceptive about that stuff and it like drives mm. me nuts because I'm like I went to school for so long to learn how to pick that stuff out you can just do it. <laughs> like, I'm like, Apparently I'm behind the curve a little bit. <laughs> but as a, yeah as a writer it does kind of start to become clear that if magic can do anything then there can never be stakes in the story. No. That's right. Like, That's right. The more powerful you make the magical system, yes, 
then you know the harder it is for, a, for anybody is. to do anything to achieve anything mm-hmm. right if you can always get yourself out by magic then there's basically no story mm-hmm. so i will say there are plenty of authors that do a good job of you know like uh kevin hearn he did the iron druid chronicles really good urban mm-hmm. fantasy he also did another fantasy series called the seven kennings or plague of giants was the first one and in in plague of giants the magic system the bigger the spell, the greater it sucked life energy out of you. So yeah, there has to be a cost. Spell, yeah, there's yeah. a cost, and it was proportional to the power of the spell. Right. So like, great that it, it's sort of self-controlling at that point. Yeah, exactly. I think you always, if you're dealing with magic, you always have to build something like that in. There has to be some kind of a cost, or the magic is unpredictable. So that you know, maybe sometimes it's going to work, but sometimes it might not. Or I mean, something has. There has to be a way for it to go wrong, or or there has to be something that you know that that costs you that you can't you can't do it over and over again. So yeah, and then my experience that cost often suggests the story. Mm -hmm. Like that that cost fundamentally is what the story is about. So um, sometimes, I mean, sometimes it's just you know. Hence demonic possession, but with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's another one I saw? Oh, uh, Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson. There, it's really clever magic system based on ingesting. Certain people have the ability to ingest powdered metals, and based on the metal, that gives them certain abilities. And mm-hmm. some of the metals, like tin, are you know anybody can get their hands on, right? But then mm-hmm. gold is a lot more expensive, mm-hmm. and so it's it's constrained by the availability of metal as well as only some people can actually right. do, the, do the magic. Mm-hmm. Huh. Mm-hmm. I know I just when I was doing it because I had like mine is a portal fantasy and so when I was writing it there's this magic book that can take people in and out of the fantasy world. I spent so much time like figuring out ways for my characters to lose and get that book back because I was like <laughs> I knew they couldn't have it right? all the time because then the readers were just like well, why don't they just leave and go home you know and it was like, <laughs> Like, I had yeah. so many like I spent- it's like the communicator in the original Star Trek like the first thing that happens when you beam down is someone hits you over your head and takes that thing <laughs> <laughs> otherwise you'd be like Scotty we need to get out of here End of episode. <laughs> yeah but that's a good example of don't make your technology so powerful that it cripples your story right Exactly. Um, Aaron, you mentioned something when we were first sort of putting this together about the chipped paint uh, the world of world building, which I really wanted to talk about because I, I, that I find that very interesting. So can you say more about that? I think I got that phrase from Beth Revis. It's definitely not original to me. But this idea that your world building shouldn't be too perfect, like it shouldn't all hang together in this perfect logical way. And um. It's a bit of a contradiction, right? Because if you're creating a world, then you get to create a world. And like you said, you get to make the rules, but then you have to play by the rules. Mm. But the real world, any version of the real world you've ever picked doesn't completely make sense. Like, you know, the Christian celebration of Easter for some reason has a rabbit that lays eggs. <laughs> right? Good point. Good point. <laughs> So your fantasy, um, your fantasy religions, you know, should probably have a rabbit that lays eggs. Why? We don't really need to get into it. <laughs> I think, and your, your science fiction should have a little chips, chips in the paint on the spaceship and a little bit of weathering and a little bit of roughness around the edges. Um, there is a, a fact in fantasy and in science fiction that sometimes bothers me that like, everything is perfectly constructed and exactly what it needs to be that makes it feel like there's no depth it makes it feel like there's it's a stage it's two inches deep and you can walk off of it so i like the feeling that there's something happening outside the edges of the story that maybe doesn't affect the story but you know that there's something happening out there um i like that you know characters have stories that they tell each other or mythologies that they refer to and the reader doesn't have to be in on them necessarily but all the characters share a mythology or you know Mm -hmm. now it is time to drape the trees with paint because we do you know (laughs) um and then the feats of strength and the airing of grievances yeah (laughs) it's it's a great idea though because really people are not consistent either and i think if you have characters that are always consistent and always you know doing things in a certain way it, it it's as you're saying it, it's maybe a little bit less believable and it lacks a little bit of depth because that's just not 
the way human beings are and it's not the way the world is Mm -hmm. yeah like i recently watched the first season of the handmaid's tale which i do not it's it's brilliant and not exactly a balm to your soul in this troubled time (laughs) no it definitely is no definitely (laughs) not and you know like the reason that i whoop The reason that I kind of buy, you know, this whole relationship of traditional, you know, it's, it's family values gone horribly wrong, right? But there's also this brothel and the brothel Mm. makes the whole thing go, oh yeah. That's right. It's consistent with human, with human nature, Mm -hmm. right? Exactly. It doesn't fit like if you wrote it and, you know, you, you did it badly, your editor would go, this really doesn't fit with these people's worldview. Right? But it's actually like I mean, but it's actually, hypocrisy. It's, what's it's actually making me perfect. Buy the world built. Exactly, know. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the brothel was a brilliant touch in that show and, and mm-hmm. in the book. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's very good. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great illustration of your point about the chipped paint. That mm-hmm. it has to be believable, but but it doesn't mean it has to be. People are not robots. They're not always the same reaction in every situation. People have inconsistencies. Mm-hmm. As long mm-hmm. as it, it reads as if, hey, this is just texture and reality, as opposed mm-hmm. to this is sloppy writing. Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. I think like the difference too, like a lot of it goes to show is, um, you know, that the writer always knows, you know, it probably, you know, you, you're as the reader, you're seeing about 25% of the actual story in the actual world and the writer knows so much more. And so I think as long as the writer knows all of the explanation behind why things exist um, and, and the writer has those kind of complexities like firmly in their head instead of rather, you know, instead of just throwing them in here and there, I think kind of yeah. that's mm. that believability. It's funny how that shows too, you know, like even though, even if you don't necessarily put it in, I think that somebody can tell whether they're reading a self-assured book uh, versus one where somebody's just sort of thrown things in helter-skelter yeah. basically so yeah I remember when I was writing when I was writing my book one of my teachers had said she was reading some drafts and there's that whole magic book in my novel and she's like well you know you're not going to put it in your story but you know that you have to write the text of that book out right like you have to write out that story and I was like oh man I do <laughs> It takes so long. I'm like, can it be a short story instead of a novel? Because <laughs> I'm like, I'm all that word. But I mean, she was right. It, it had to happen, or I would never know kind of the whole mythology behind, mm. you know, behind mm-hmm. it. So. Yeah, yeah, that's a good example. I'm writing one right now about, well, I have one on submission right now about a boy who's recovering from trauma. And the trauma isn't on screen, it's, it's a recovery book, right? Mm. It's, it's a book about healing. But I found that eventually I did have to write the scenes. I did have to write it down. You so know, that I, you knew. So that I yeah. knew. What and, then, and then oddly, you, you draw on it, even in ways that I think you don't yeah. realize, you mm-hmm. know? Um, like, I just know when I was working on that never-ending fantasy of mine, um, and I ended up rewriting it, I don't know, I, I can't even count how many times. But I think, that, and it seemed like a waste of time, right? But actually, in the end, what you're doing is like, you're learning your world so well. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're learning your world so well that you end up being able to draw on things that you don't even really realize you don't even really realize you're drawing on you just sort of know it so I think I'm, I'm curious I was kind of looking through like our um our questions that we had kind of talked about too and I know like um I, I'm very drawn as an adult to to fantasy more so than I was as a kid even but like I know a lot of times when I talk to like the, the kids who are like super huge readers and like really really into books like it's always fantasy right that they're like they can mm. talk about and talk about like why do you think that kids are so drawn to fantasy as opposed to other genres oh I have a theory <laughs> what's your theory it's it's I think the same way the kids are drawn to dinosaurs it's you know, you want, when you're little, you want to be an adult. You want, what you want is more power than you have. So dinosaurs are big and strong and tall. Adults are big and strong and tall. Superheroes, people with magic, people with phasers and starships can do stuff you can't do. You long to be more than you are. Interesting. I think there's a way finding element to particularly in portal fantasies or something like Harry Potter, which is more or less a portal fantasy. You know, it's like you, you get dumped into this confusing world where there are rules and things that you don't understand and people have mysterious hidden agendas. And that sounds a lot like junior high to me. (laughs) (laughs) 
but I do think there's something a little bit more uh, going on. My kids are teenagers. They are 14 and 12. Yay. And, uh, and I write for about that age range too, and possibly I'm permanently stuck there myself. And I actually really like teenagers. I love teenagers. I know this is an unpopular opinion. But I think they're fabulous. Um, and people always level at them this charge that they're dramatic. And they are. But they're not making it up. Right? They're genuinely experiencing this, you know, weddings and funerals level of interaction every day, which is exhausting and why they're exhausting to be around sometimes. But um, in fantasy, you can take completely ordinary problems and just bump them up a level so that they match that emotional intensity. Like Cinderella is basically a story about prom as life and death. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> um, and prom is not life and death, but to some kids it feels like life and death. And Cinderella and fantasy and science fiction and things like mystery and adventure and historical things are all ways of taking an ordinary story and bumping it up so that the emotional intensity matches. So mm -hmm. I think, I think that's teenagers specifically, but I, I write a lot of YA and that's, that's where I think they are. You know, it's like Buffy. It's like, was my high school built over the mouth of hell or was my high school just <laughs> built over the mouth of hell, right? Or, you know, it takes something like nobody really understands me and turns it into I'm trapped in a fairy realm. You know, <laughs> it's, it's these very ordinary problems, but you get mm. to tell them in a way that respects how serious they are through the language of myth. Because I, otherwise you just sound, you know, like you're overdoing it a little bit. Right, yeah. I love that you said that too about Buffy because I remember as, as I was watching it, I was even feeling that way. It was like, wow, it takes all the problems that you had as a kid and just adds this magic. Just literalizes them, right? The worst thing ever. Well, it was like, even like, I remember, and this is kind of a weird example, but I remember like Buffy had like her first like sexual experience, right? And so it wasn't mm -hmm. like, oh, the guy just like blew her off and started being a jerk. It was like, oh, well, that made him turn into a vampire. Um, and now he's going to try to kill you and mm -hmm. blow you off. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's like, it's just, you know, it's just, it just exaggerates everything. Mm -hmm. That's a good example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've missed Buffy in my life. I've ne I never, I never saw it. I never... I'm not sure it's aged well. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Um, okay. But at the time I was like, yay! <laughs> I, I still like it. <laughs> I haven't seen it like in the last 15 years or so, hmm. but. You have to ignore the special effects. They're not oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was, I cut my teeth on old school Doctor Who. I am an expert at ignoring the special effects. <laughs> It's like our alien is a blanket with some slinkies on it today. I thought that was part of its charm that <laughs> focuses on the story and not on the, the special effects. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Just keep telling yourself that. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, I love some great ideas though. I even wrote that down. Uh, like, I love that idea, especially of longing to be more than you are. Um, yeah. And then the, dra the drama of it. That's, yeah. That's delicious. Um, oh, we were talking about. It. I was just looking through um, some of our other topics. Um, what about we talked? We haven't really talked too much about that idea. Well, a little bit. I don't know if this is a good topic to bring up or not. Um, because we had a question about how about how fantasy often focuses around the sense of a world gone wrong. I guess we touched hmm. on that a little bit. Um, but is that uh, why do you why do you think uh, why do you think that does happen? Um, I've been I mean, thinking about that, but I don't have a, I don't have a great answer. I just like we all imprinted on Lord of the Rings, right? And Lord of the Rings is essentially, is it the end of the third age? My, my yes. fellow Tolkien geeks are going to come shoot me. It's <laughs> the end of the third age. You know, it's the story about the ending of the world of magic, you know, and it's like and the departure all, of the elves and the departure yes. of the elves. <laughs> You know, whose, whose kingdoms are only um, kept in balance through the three rings that they are questing now to destroy. Um, there is this sense of high fantasy taking place in a world full of ruins. That, yes, we are magic, but once we were much more. Hmm. I well, don't know what that is. Well, why I don't not? know what that is. How about, I mean, what could be higher stakes than the, the fate of the world, right? You got to, if you don't destroy the ring and Sauron gets it, the whole the whole world because goes under the sway of a, of a monster. So, well, yeah, high that's stakes, the but ultimate we don't, in stakes. 
it that's high stakes but that's kind of separate from you know the the sense of the like it's structured so that if you destroy the ring you also in a different way destroy the world you destroy the world of magic and mm. it's maybe not it wasn't evident to me when i read it in sixth grade but when you read it again you can see it and there's a lot of particularly high fantasy that is you know this sense of the fading world and i don't know is that is that european does that does the, do we do that everywhere is it um, remember the I, romans or i feel like it's i mean it, again if we're writing fantasy as something of a reflection of our own world we're looking at our own world which is failing um and maybe trying to figure it out i don't know if it i, I mean hmm. everybody has different reasons for for why they set their their books in particular worlds but i feel like Either it's a grappling um, of good versus evil, or it's mm -hmm. looking at a world that has really gone wrong, i.e. ours, and mm -hmm. sort of trying to, to figure out, I mean, not necessarily coming up with answers for how to save our own world, but just sort of reflecting on the fact that, you know, things are, things are not looking so good. And, and yeah. you know, rather than, I guess, again, rather than being heavy handed about it and, and talking about it in a direct way, we're talking about it in an indirect way and as a way of, of reflecting on, on you know how things are going wrong but i, I think a, go ahead i was just gonna say that reminded that's a great uh, way of describing there's an episode of star trek where it's you're it's in another place another time but it's really talking about a current issue so there's this one episode where these two aliens are in mortal combat and why because one is black on one side and white on the other side mm. of his face and the other ones the colors are reversed and and the Enterprise crew is like, why are you guys fighting? You're the same. Like, what do you mean we're the same? We have color on opposite sides of our face. And it's like, you know, it's just, a, it was a convenient cloak for racism. Mm. So sometimes you might be wanting to talk, your, your theme is just better told with the That's true. costuming sometimes of another just world. Sometimes it's literalizing it. And in Tolkien's case in particular, you know, it's, it's hard to ignore that he lived through an apocalypse. He served in the trenches yes in, in world yeah. war one and yeah. you know saw the fall of the gilded age and all the optimism that went with that um and yeah i think know, that was, answers your question earlier Aaron, yeah. which is he you win a war it's still there's still loss even when you win the war yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's a veteran story isn't it it really is it's interesting because a lot of times people will call fantasy, you know, escapism and say that people are trying to escape from the world when, when you really- Which is fine. I mean, let me off the ride, right? <laughs> but, you know, a lot of times it's really, it kind of forces you to examine the world in just a different way, you know, without even- mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it can magnify certain things. And, and I mean, and I don't, it, it's hard to, to confront the problem of evil in a contemporary setting i mean mm -hmm. i guess you can do it in in terms of uh, crime novels or, or horror or whatever um but i think fantasy is one way of of trying to confront the problem of evil without bringing things like religion into it and and all these other sort of difficult thorny issues that are going to cause problems for well for the author possibly and mm -hmm. also for other readers and it, i don't know it, it just I, I remember that when i was writing my fantasy that was one of the things i was i was trying to deal with was sort of the nature of evil and that was the only way i could think of to come at it in a way that might be effective mm -hmm. yeah it does let you ask big questions with a totally mm -hmm. straight face yes exactly um, it, yeah it really like my second book sorrow is not the one no one read is basically um it's like what do we do with death and there is no good answer i mean they mm. find a bad answer but <laughs> mm. there is there is no good answer and yet it is um you know it's it's very difficult i think to ask that kind of question with a straight face in contemporary realistic work. it's tough yeah, it it's, tough. it's tough to write we about. We switched without... gears. Like I've yeah. switched gears. I wrote a contemporary reel. Is anyone else? Somebody yeah, I've, I've switched. switched I have also. Yeah, I switched Doesn't into it historical. Suck. I so <laughs> miss being able to drop a dragon on the roof to get the plot <laughs> moving. <laughs> I'm no, like, oh. I've had the opposite. I've had the opposite experience because I found that like 
fantasy was so hard. It was so much harder than I expected it to be. And then mm -hmm. I decided to write a book about East Germany, which I admit there, the research was really not a lot of fun. I had to read a lot of books about it. But then I had basically my world was like ready made, like all the all the stuff was already there. You know, mm -hmm. I just sort of had to slip my characters in. So I don't know. I, I mean, I agree in some sense, like it's, it's kind of fun to be able to just, yeah, throw a dragon in or a talking cat, which you have a great one. And I actually also had a talking cat in my book. <laughs> Too much fun. All cats can talk. They just don't find us worthy. I think that's very true. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, like I found that, that fantasy in other respects is so difficult to, I feel like there's a, an element to it that you almost can't put a name on. Um, that, that I think about like the Hobbit is, is just a great example of it. Like a Hobbit is a thing that works somehow that Tolkien made it work. And, and to be able to create something like that, that works like Quidditch or, or, you know, any of those sorts that that's mm -hmm. really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, like you can, and, and I can't really figure out why when somebody sort of throws sort of a random fantasy thing together that doesn't fit, it doesn't work like a Hobbit versus the Hobbits. What okay. is the difference? I'm not really sure, but um, like, I think that that's one of the hardest elements of, of fantasy writing is to, is to hit that, that fitness of, of, mm -hmm. of elements of characters or, or creatures or whatever it is. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. That kind of brings me, I guess, I know we're starting to I, I was, I know we're starting to run out of time and I was looking to see if we had questions on the Facebook chat and I don't see any, but I will, um, I will ask you guys, I'm, I'm curious, I know for people who are watching, a lot of people are writing fantasy or want to write fantasy, um, what advice, like, what do you think is, you know, either, you know, the most important thing to keep in mind or the hardest thing to manage or like basically what advice would you have for, for writers who, who want to write mm. fantasy? Well, I, I, this is really a writing piece of advice in general. If you're writing for children, then make sure you understand the market. If you're like, if you need to know if you're writing a picture book, a chapter book, a middle grade novel or a young adult novel, because that has impacts on your word choice, on the themes, on the, the length. Um, so know what you're doing. Don't, don't just write and then decide, oh, well, it's 90,000 words. I guess it's YA. Well, <laughs> you may not have written a YA novel. It just happens to be 90,000 words. So know what you're trying to do. I think we as a group came up with a really good point early on about um, be mostly consistent, like don't leave glaring plot. It's fine to have intentional inconsistencies, but don't have unintentional inconsistencies, mm -hmm. either in magic or in character behavior. That's very, yeah, that's very good advice. Yeah. Ooh, this is a hard one, though. What makes fantasy in particular tick? And how do you like troubleshoot it if it's not ticking? Anybody got troubleshooting advice? More dragons. More dragons. <laughs> Talking well, cats. I, I think one of the one of the biggest dangers with writing fantasy that, that at least I come across when I read manuscripts is info dumping. I mean, that's one of oh, the yeah. one of the hardest things to control as like for a lot, so many reasons. I mean, mainly because um, we're afraid that that our readers aren't going to understand what we're doing. And so we have to like, you know, say, well, okay, this is how the world works. And this is, this goes here and that goes there. Um, and I would, I mean, I guess if you read good fantasy, you can see that that is not the way the authors do it. They, they, mm -hmm. they, they throw you in and they sort of keep you on a need to know basis. And, you know, you, you find things out as you need to know them as the character is interacting with this, with the world, rather than having the whole information of the world sort of basically dumped on your, on your doorstep before you even start. So I think it, controlling the info dump is, I mean, it's, it's a big challenge and it's, it's definitely something that, that you need to learn how to do. All right, you went to all this trouble building a world. You want to share the details. Oh, that's also yeah. true. That's also yeah, true. And I mean, true. that's, that's, that's true of historical fiction too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, absolutely. You read uh, the unabridged version of Les Miserables and then that 150 page section about the uh, history of the Paris sewer section system that everybody cuts out of the abridged. <laughs> Cut that stuff out. Yeah. <laughs> I think, Cut out um, the sewer system. <laughs> the, the Turkey City lexicon, which if readers don't know it, should look it up. It's an old, old science fiction message board. But they're, they're, 
hand wave for that is I suffered for my art and now it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> like this detail is so hard one. I am going to wedge it in. Yes. Yeah. You're putting it in. I know. I completely, I understand that so well. I mean, mm -hmm. I, but, but you, but you have to, I mean, usually that's why you need an editor. You need somebody mm -hmm. else to say, you know what? I don't care how hard you suffered. Like nobody needs to know about this. This has to come out. It's, it's boring. We don't mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. So, but at the same time, I think it's easy to overestimate how much of the story makes sense because you know it mm, already. That's also true. Right. Yeah. That's the like, challenge. It makes sense in your head because you already know it. Um, but readers get lost much faster than you think they're going to. Mm. And you kind of, I mean, you maybe don't need to hand them a map at the beginning, but I do think you need to be generous with like the handholds and the blazings on the path and which is all the more reason the value that this supports the value of beta readers and critique groups. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I don't know if it's possible to write a fantasy without getting those, those critique groups and getting that feedback. Cause like, you really don't know like how much the reader needs to know sometimes. Yeah. Like, sometimes Very true. Time. And yeah. like, I know for me, like you were saying where, it's, you know, Michelle, where it's hard not to info dump. Like I write a long prologue to every single one of my books. I write multiple drafts of multiple prologues. And then my workshop group is like, you know, take it out. You don't need it. Take it out. And I'm like, you just don't understand. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> time it's done. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I can give it to the prologue. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Thanks guys. You know, but yeah. like. Nobody I'm, wants to part with their prologue ever, yeah, like, ever. I love me a prologue. <laughs> I don't care. I do. <laughs> Many uh, confusing things too. I know because I do a lot of editing and a lot of times I'll say, well, I don't really understand. And they're like, that's okay. You'll find out by the end. And I'm like, oh, no, no. I need to understand now in chapter one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes I find that I do discover things as I, well, always, I'm not, I'm not much of an outliner. I try, I know it would be more efficient if I knew where the story was going before I started writing it, but it never seems to work that way. Um, but really revision is your chance to make yourself look really smart. Like, like, <laughs> That's right. Oh, these are the themes of the story and this is how the plot progresses. And I know exactly which point I'm going to hit and it's all on purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We are so if, as writers that we yeah <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. well i see that we've kind of run up against our time unless you guys had any final thoughts that you wanted to, to chime in um anything that i've i've left out um you want everybody to tell you their website address oh good idea yeah, like man. <laughs> henry you're on the ball you're up it's my name, henryhertz.com. No T in my name, H-E-R-Z. Okay. Um, I'm michellebarker.ca. And I'm erinbow.com, B-O-W. I'm taragilboy.com. So um, hopefully hopefully you can find us. We can always put our, uh, maybe put our links in the comment section. Um, oh, mm -hmm. that's a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. People can yeah. find us. So um, thank you guys. I'll have you guys just stick around for just a second, but I'm going to Facebook now. So thanks, you guys. I think we'll try to sign off. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm.